Okay, so uh, welcome back uh, to our uh, discussion of the Introduction to Statistical Learning uh, textbook. And this is the last chapter uh, titled Multiple Testing. This is the second, <laughs> the, the second, the second part of, of our discussion. Uh, we're going to do some Python, you know, uh, uh, discussion on, you know, the things that we have uh, discussed theoretically. But I just wanted to make sure that, you know, we get some of the main points of this chapter. And, and let me... Give you again that slide from the, you know, from this, uh, from one, one of the videos that I was, uh, you know, uh, watching to get more information to understand the, the information. So, what happens is that when we're doing multiple testing, right? When we're doing multiple testing, uh, we are doing tests on, let me see if I can do it here. Okay, here we go. Uh, we're doing multiple uh, statistical tests on the same sample of data. And that's very important to consider uh, for, for this, you know, for, for this uh, um, uh, hypothesis testing. If you are doing multiple analysis on different samples of data, uh, this one, this one apply. Okay, so that's one of the assumptions that it has to be clear from the first. And also we discuss about the you know, the, the type one error, we didn't discuss too much about the type two error because the family-wise error rate is based on, you know, trying to minimize the chances of committing a type one error. But one of the things that you should be aware is that what is, what is the type one error, right? So when you have a statistical uh, test, you usually have to have a null hypothesis, correct? Which is, usually is the state where the real world uh, should be. And in this case, uh, could be, for example, that the mean of the sample uh, is not different from the mean of the population, okay? Which is the sample is the one that we're uh, grabbing to get an inference from the population. So we can say, okay, this sample uh, the mean of this sample or, you know, any other statistic is not different or, you know, too, too different than the mean of the population. So if that is correct, then you have what is called a, a true negative. So if we do the test and we see that the null hypothesis, we don't have enough evidence to reject it, then we can say that, you know, that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. But we commit a type one error when the null hypothesis is true, okay? So there, even though there's a, a difference between that mean of the sample and the mean of population, but still the null hypothesis is true, then we reject it. And that's the type one error. And it's associated with what is called an alpha. The alpha is the threshold of what is the limit that we're going to consider if we are going to fail to reject or reject. Okay, so the family-wise uh, error rate, the first one that, that we're studying is that when you do multiple analysis, you could uh, increase the chances of committing this type of, of error. And for example, we can do this calculation. Okay, yeah. We can do this calculation of a family-wise family error rate where the alpha, the original alpha is 0 0.05, for example. So if the p-value of our statistic is uh, within 0 0.05 or more, uh, we don't we fail to reject. If, if it is less than 0 0.05, then we reject the null hypothesis. But if we do three statistical tests on the same sample of data, uh, the family-wise error is going to be the, the multiplication of that alpha, right, to the exponent of the three, you know, adding, adding you know, uh, subtracting those, 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 uh, those ones, you know, ra, ra, you know, in this, in the, in the, with this formula, which comes from this, all right? So in other words, 
your family-wise error rate is going to be increasing as you increase the number of uh, tests that you're doing with the same sample of data, okay? So in other words, if we were rejecting, if we will fail to reject something that it had a p-value, let's say of 0.1, then with the family-wise error rate without any corrections, which is going to be now 0 0.4, 1, 0 0.143, then we will be rejecting something that maybe doesn't need to be rejected and then we're committing that type one error. Okay, so are we clear on that in that sense? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. So one of the things that the book uh, explains is that there are some methods to correct that, you know, uh, family a wise error rate that we discussed. And there are basically two approaches. The, the one that the book you know, uses is the one that is called approach one. And is dividing that original alpha, uh, alpha value by the number of tests that we're going to be you know, uh, doing you know, to that uh, same sample of data. So in the case that you know, we were studying that there were only three we're going to divide that alpha, original alpha, into uh, divided by the number of uh, uh, you know the number of of of, of uh, tests that we're doing to that sample size. And if we take the value of alpha 0 0.05 and the statistical uh, th uh, choice of three, which is the lowercase m, is going to give you 0 0.017. So that's going to be your new adjusted family-wise error rate. So if you go back to those p-values, then if anything is greater than 0 0.017, you will fail to reject your, your null hypothesis. But if something is lower than that, then uh, we're going to reject it, okay? So in other words, the, the Bonferry correction, what is trying to minimize the chance of incurring in, in that type one error when we just have that family-wise rate uncorrected or unadjusted, all right? And there's another, another second approach, but it basically have the same, you know, the, the same results, which is multiply the CRP values by the number of performed statistical analysis, and then we get the new, you know, uh, uh, corrected uh, p-values, okay? And in this case, the p-values, the new corrected values, this was, you know, from a, from the sample, the new corrected values would be this, okay? And then instead of adjusting our alpha, what we're doing is adjusting the p-values. And then our alpha is going to be the same, 0 0.05, and then we use those new corrected p-values to uh, you know, uh, see if we can fail, fail to reject the no hypothesis or reject it, okay? And it more or less has the same, you know, the same, uh, uh, results, all right? Okay, so we talk about, right, those family-wise type errors, but there's another technique that is called false discovery rate, which we didn't have a chance to discuss in the previous uh, meeting. So one of the, uh, one of the, uh, you know, the, the, the arguments against the family-wise uh, error rate is that sometimes it's too, too stringent, especially with the corrections, okay? So this false discovery rate, what we're going to do is going back to this diagram here, okay? Which is the same matrix that we're using for the, you know, the true, po the true negatives, the true positives, false positives, false negatives. Instead of only you know, working with this uh, a V, uh, capital V, which is the type, you know, the type one error, right? The, the ones that if the null hypothesis is true, we are rejecting it. We're, we're uh, incurring in that type one error. So now we're going to consider these two uh, values. The, the false positives, right? The false positives, and then the, the true positives, which is when the, uh, no hypothesis is false and we reject it. So that's the correct approach, right? You know, true, true positive. So we have false hypothesis at V, 
and true positives at C. So in this case, what we're going to do is divide, right? That uh, false uh, number of false positives divided by the number of false positives plus the true positives, okay? And that's going to give you this uh, formulation. Uh, R is going, to, is going to be equal to the V plus the S. And we're going to see that that VR, the expected value of that VR is going to be kind of the new value, the new threshold that we're going to use to then see if we fail to reject or uh, reject the, uh, the null hypothesis, okay? Uh, usually these values uh, in, the, in the theory, they're called Q values, you know, which is transforms that, that, you know, that alpha, you know, that VR transformance into those Q values. So let me go back to the book, okay? In the book, in that page, five, six, seven, uh, we were studying the performance of uh, hedge fund managers uh, from a, da a database, I believe it's about 2,000 uh, managers. And we have data over the period of performance of the portfolio over 50 months for each of the managers. And in this table, well, we only have the first five. Of those 2,000, the first five, uh, we have the mean, we have the standard deviation, we have the t-statistic, and we have the p-value. The p-value is the one that we, you know, are centering. So here, if we have an alpha of 0 0.05, it's clear that manager two, manager four, and manager five, they're going to be above that threshold of alpha, right? So do we fail to reject or reject no hypothesis for those managers with an alpha of 0 0.05. Do we fail to reject or reject the null hypothesis? In other words, the null hypothesis is that there's no difference between the managers and the performance of the portfolio. That will be our null hypothesis. What do you think? So anyone yeah, so anyone with a p-value greater than um, 0 0.05, we right. reject them. And anyone with less, we fail to reject because we don't have enough evidence to prove that they're not from the population. Okay. Uh, Lucio, what do you think? Uh, well, yes, I also think that that is the case if we are considering only the the non-familiar how, how was it called non-family error rate oh no no we're, we're not considering the family wise rate yet okay. just just, the, the, just yes, the yes. alpha alpha against those p-values and the alpha let's say that you know we agree that uh, 0 0.05 will be a good threshold so what, what happens with those managers the two the four and the five we have a greater value the p-value is greater than alpha do you <laughs> fail to reject or reject the null hypothesis? Yeah, we fail to reject for those. Correct. Fail to reject. In other words, those are those are true, you know, true negatives. Okay. I said it because backwards. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I, I I I think you did. That, that's why I asked Lucio. That's why. Okay. So what happens is that we don't have enough evidence, at least from the t statistic, because the p value is the area of the probability that that t statistic is going to be that value or greater, okay? So we don't have enough uh, information, right? Enough, enough evidence to state that there is a difference between the performance of the, of, of the managers within themselves, okay? Within the population, okay? But with manager one and three, which is 0 0.006 and 0 0.012, uh, is less than, than the alpha, right? So if we are going to apply the theory, that means that we're going to reject the, the null hypothesis. But we don't know if we're incurring to a, a, a type one error or not. We're, we're not, you know, uh, you know, we, we, we don't know, we don't know that. Okay. We're just st stating, okay, if the alpha is 0 0.05, two, four, and five, we cannot reject. In other words, uh, you can pick any one of those and you will have basically the same performance. You know, they will give you the same performance in your portfolio. There's no statistical difference between them. 
But from one and three, according to the, the alpha that we chose, uh, we will have you know a significant increase in performance. Okay, for these two uh, managers, in respect to the population that they are they are in. Okay, good, clear. Good. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So far. Okay. We're good. Okay. So now we're going to apply the Bonferroni test, the Bonferroni method, to this table. Okay. So how many uh, statistical tests are we doing in that table? How how many? What is the M? The value of M. The number of managers. Correct. Uh, five. Okay, that's going to be our five. In other words, we're, go we're doing five statistical uh, tests with the same sample of data, right? Okay, so what we're going to do is, Don Ferroni is very simple, is divide that alpha, the 0 0.05 that we had, against M, which is five, okay? The number of tests that we're doing to that, to that data. So now, the family-wise error rate, according to the Bonferroni uh, uh, correction, if we do 0 0.05 divided by five, right? We get now a family-wise error rate of 0 0.01, correct? Yes? Yes, yes. Okay, so now our family-wise error rate is going to be 0 0.01. So what happens to manager three? Now we're saying manager three is from the population. Exactly. Now manager three, the p-value, because we didn't do anything with the p-value, just with the alpha, okay, to get the, that family-wise error rate. Now the alpha is less, right? You know, that value, p-value is greater than the new family-wise error rate, you know, our new alpha. And now we can say that, you know, doing that multiple testing, the manager three, we don't have enough evidence to reject our null hypothesis. In other words, three goes in the same bucket as two, four, and five. So we only reject number one because number one is really low. 0 0.006, right? Is less than 0 0.01. And that's one that that is the one that is going to be, you know, the same. In other words, with the uh, corrected uh, alpha, we rejected, right? The no hypothesis in, in my year three. But with the bomb for any correction, we failed to reject that no hypothesis. So probably that p value. That's, that manager 3P value could be, could have been a type one error, okay? For the unadjusted, uh, you know, correction uh, method. Because the Bonferron is saying, no, no, you have to divide by the number of, of tests. And then if that is going to be the root threshold, then that's the one you're going to be using, okay? Good. Okay, so there's another method, which is called the Holmes uh, method. And I'm not going to go you know, much in detail, but this one kind of tries to balance a little bit more the Bonferroni because the Bonferroni usually also is too astringent. So here, what we do a little bit different is that we order those three values. So we're going to order those three values by the different tests. And then we're going to use that ranking to adjust our uh, our alpha, okay? And then that alpha, and you can you can see the mathematical, uh, you know, uh, equations here in this, uh, you know, uh, highlighted. You can see that uh, we're going to be do, uh, using the ranking position of those order p-values to then do an adjustment on the alpha, all right? And in this case, uh, the home, it says that it's more powerful than Bonferroni, right? Because it tries to do a balance between the, the type one errors and also minimize the two, the type, type two errors. In this case, with the Bonferroni, remember that we rejected 
the 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 manager um, number three. That was the the difference between done correct and corrected. In this case, let me see what happens here. 0 0.06, 0 0.02, okay. Uh, yeah, 0 0.0125, okay. So in this case, in the homes, in this case, we are going to reject again the p-values uh, indicated on the manager number one and manager number three. No, in other words, we're going back to that uncorrected uh, procedure that, that we did, but we do it with the rankings, okay? Uh, and there's other methods. There's the two key method, you know, uh, chef method, et cetera. All right. But these are the most, you know, uh, common methods to do. Now, there's another one, and we just briefly discussed it, right, with the false uh, discovery rate. And in this one, it does a similar procedure like the Holmes uh, procedure, okay? Uh, in other words, it, it, it uses the ranking also of those p-values. But instead of, you know, adjusting, right? Adjusting, you are going to adjust the, the alpha here. We're going to just uh, adjust it, but a little more straighter. Uh, instead of doing that formulation of, you know, number of tests uh, plus one minus, minus the ranking, we're going to divide it through the position of each of these uh you know, of, of, of these p-values. And this is the formula that, you know, the Benjamin Hochberg procedure does for the uh, false discovery uh, rate. And this these are the, the, the mathematical formulations here. Okay, let me see if I can put this, okay, here. So we order our p-values and then we adjust the alpha depending on the ranking of each of, the, of those, you know, of, of those uh, tests, okay? So for example, for the first one, which is 0 0.006, we're going to adjust the alpha multiplying one divided by five. And that's going to give us, give us the new alpha. And then we, we, uh, we make a judgment in terms of the p-value is greater or less than that new adjusted alpha and so forth, okay? And this one, what it does is that it really converts those, uh, those uh, alphas uh, converted to what is called the Q values, which are the ones that are going to be compared with the P values. Okay. Uh, let me see if I have something else. Okay, those are the case studies, etc. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, one question. Uh, mm -hmm. Out of all of these methods that we have been covering, yes. Uh, at least that, as I understand it, it's not that there is one better than another mm -hmm. that one chooses based on controlling either type one or type two errors, right? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. This is more trying to control the type one error because the type two error is associated what is called with the power of the sample. You know, this uh, concept of power of the sample. And because you have fixed already the treasure of alpha, it already impacts uh, what is called the beta, which is the probability of committing a type two error. So the only way that you can minimize when you fix the alpha, which gives you the beta, beta, uh, the only way that you can decrease the probability of, of beta, you know, the, 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 the uh, decrease the beta uh, magnitude is to increase the size of the sample, okay? You know, you increase the size of the sample, you have more power to the sample. So then you should have a less probability of committing a type two error. All right. Um, is there also um, a similar situation, like instead of fixing alpha and minimizing mm -hmm. beta, something like fixing beta to minimize alpha? Uh, you could do that, but that's not usually what the, you know, the, the hypothesis testing, you know, uh, does in, you know, in the traditional sense. Uh, let's say if, if you go Bayesian, for example, you have other, other, you know, uh, uh, ways to deal with alpha and beta, not by thresholds, but by, uh, pro the probabilities of each of the distribution, et cetera. 
Uh, but in this case, because we're talking about a frequentist, uh, you know, a method, uh, you usually work with a type one error because usually the type one error is the one that you want to avoid. Okay, remember the the you know the question that I that I, that I gave you, you know, about the criminal uh, case that the threshold is that you know the the person is innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, what do you want to avoid? In the type one error, you want to avoid, you know, imprisoning persons that are innocent. Okay, the type two error would be, you know, letting free the guilty, which we can, you know, we, we can live with that. But we cannot live. Uh, our system doesn't, you know, it's biased to guaranteeing that the that the innocent person doesn't go to jail. Okay, this is not convicted, and that's the type one error. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So usually you want to control that the type one error to um, to 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 the extent that then you can then by the size of the sample you can control also the type two error because they they're both linked okay they're both okay. linked and also and also depends on the cost also of each of the type one error of the type error sorry go, go ahead Luz. Uh, I was saying okay thanks. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let's go to the to one of the exercises, the applied exercises. Okay. Uh, which is number seven. And this data set we have seen it before. The car seats uh, data set. Uh, let me show you uh, where uh, we discussed in chapter three when we're talking about linear regression. Uh huh. Okay, this is the uh, car seats data set, and it's a data frame uh, that consists of four hundred uh, observations or you know rows with eleven variables or columns. And here, uh, the variable of interest is the sales, the the the, the sales of uh of the car of the car seats in thousands at each location, and you have all these you know uh potential potential predictors of competitive price, income of the, of the community, advertising dollars, population price, shelf location, age, education, if it's urban, the location or not, and if it's in the US or not. Okay, so that's the type data set that we're going to be working on. Uh, okay, so this is the notebook. Can you see the notebook? Yeah, we can see it. You can see it? Okay. So uh, if you want to follow on, let me see. I think I have the, the GitHub. Let me see if I have the GitHub here. Uh, let, me, let me get that. Just Positories, ISM. Okay, you, you want to follow, it's in chapter 13. I'm going to uh, post the link there. Okay. Hey, the notebook is in chapter 13 and it's called seven, seven, uh, you know, Jupyter notebook uh, extension. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is import some of the libraries and you should already be uh, familiar with this. We're going to load pandas, NumPy. We're going to load the stats model uh, uh, dot API as SM that contains the, the linear regression model because we're going to be using you know that model. And then the library from SciPy, which is the scientific uh, Py Python library that it has the library for stats, okay? So let's load this. Uh, for visualization, I didn't do any visualization. I just, you know, uh, became aware of this. But if you, if, you know, it's usually good, you know, to usually have this uh, libraries in, you know, in, in your environment. Uh, the Matplotlib, the Seaborn library. I'm going to use a style, uh, uh, you know, from Seaborn. Just like the, you know, if you're familiar with ggplot, it will be like a theme. Right, and then uh, 
filter the, the warnings and do the parameters, uh, configure the parameters of the figure of the of the of, of, of the of the plot by 10, 10 by eight. Okay. Okay, so we're going to then load the data set, the cars sees data set. Uh, one thing that I did after, you know, I I realized that if you don't use that argument uh, index column, what it's going to do is that it's going to create an index column. And then there's one column that is called SLNO, you know, like a serial number. Uh, that one also is an index. So what I'm going to do is use that column as my index for the data frame. Because in the pandas data frame, you need you need an index. If not, it will create it for you. Okay, so we load that. We load the car seats. These are the first five uh, observations. And as you can see, the SLNO, that, you know, that index uh, column is going to be our index column. And then uh, we have the sales, the com, the income, advertising, et cetera. And it's always good to check uh, what kind of data types do we have here if they are in the correct data type. So for example, we're, going, we're not going to see that the SLIO and all because that one is the index. So I'm going to see it here. But then we have sales, sales is a float, good. Uh, Com price is an integer, good. Income, integer. Advertising, population, price, integer. Share location is an object, in other words, it's a you know, categorical. Age is a numerical integer. Education, urban is a categorical and US categorical. Okay, good. So just to give you a little more information about the exercise, okay? So we already have, you know, in our environment, how the cars set data sets. So the first exercise that we're going to do is that it says for each quantitative variable, no, in other words, a numeric variable, in the data set besides sales, sales is going to be our, you know, our response, right? Our why. A fit, a linear model to predict sales using that quantitative variable. So which are the numeric variables? So we can do, what we can do is select those numeric variables from the data set using select D types, okay? Select D types, which is, you know, uh, uh, a function that is attached to that, to that, uh, to any 20 data frame from pandas. And then what I'm going to do is just include for the select data types on this data, data types, just include the ones that are numeric. Okay. In this case, the ones that are numbers. So it's going to include not only the integer, but also the float uh, types. Okay. Uh, we need the column names and then we need it to convert it to a list. So that is going to be called our new, uh, you know, uh, list is going to be called calls uh, underscore num. Okay, and there we have it. We have sales, we have comp, price, we have income, advertising, population, price, age, and education. Okay, you can check it here. The only ones that we are discarding are the shelf location, the urban, and the US. Okay, so now we're going to fit right? We're going to fit uh, with each of those variables uh, and using sales as a response, we're going to fit a linear regression. So the first intent that I did with this, because I wanted to loop, okay, you know, do, do it kind of a for loop, to loop from sales, get each of the columns, right? Each of, of, of the columns of the, uh, of, of, the of, uh, of this list, and do a linear regression for each each of them. So one of the things that I did was uh, from the list because I don't I don't need I don't need I don't need sales in in that list. Okay, uh, there is a command from Python that is called pop, which what it does is that if you give it a zero, it's going to remove the first element. Right in this case, sales the first element of that of that list. So pop parenthesis zero and you attach it to the to the list is going to get then remove it. And the thing that I want and I need to remove it because I'm not going to do a linear regression of sales by sales. 
I'm going to do it sales and then another, you know, another column, another variable. So that was the first step, right? And then using the stats model, okay, I'm going to uh, create a Y, the response that is the, the you know, the vector of the sales, of, of, of the sales, the car seat sales. And then I'm going to do a loop, right? For column in columns number in this list, now in this new list, I'm going to print the column because I want to know which is the variable that I'm doing as an independent, you know, to keep track. And then I'm going to uh, do a, a, the X matrix, which is that the, the, the predictors, right? Car seats with columns. So it's going to iterate for each of those columns is going to create a new X, which is the, the predictor, the, the, the independent. Uh, in stats model, we need to add the constant and add the intercept, do the LOS, with the SM, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, function, uh, we do a LOS, which is the ordinary linear regression. Uh, it's going to include the Y, the X, and then we're going to fit it. We're going to print the summary, and then we're going to insert, you know, uh, a return to then create a space between each of these, uh, you know, uh, summaries. So if I run this, okay, this is what I get. Let me show you here. This is what I get. So I get a summary of a linear regression taking sales as response, you know, fix, and then each of the numeric variables, okay? And you get all this information from each of the regressions. But what happened? When I started to, you know, get a little bit more, you know, more involved, I said, hey, you know, I just need this number, the p-value, right? Because that's what, that's what the exercise is, 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 you know, trying to tell me. Report the p-values associated with the coefficients for the variable. So really, I don't need all this, correct? I just need this p-value. So I started looking for another, you know, another way <laughs> to do this, okay? And I'm going to do the same thing here, you know, just create the, the list again of the numeric variables, including sales. And then... Uh, I'm going to set then, you know, this is the second, you know, the second iteration of this exercise. I'm going to set, instead of doing the pop and the, you know, uh, using the, the stats model in, in that way, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to set the index to uh, sales as the index. Instead, instead of the SLNO, uh, set the sales as an index and you see, uh, you, you, you see why. Okay, so I'm going to modify the car seats. I'm going to, uh, you know, get a new data frame car seats uh, underscore number. And now that data set is going to have the sales as the index and then the rest of the predictors as, you know, the columns of the of the data frame. So in this uh, stack overflow uh, post, uh, there was this similar question about how to do a linear regression with all the columns of a data frame. And this is the, you know, this was the main the main solution that one of the programmers gave. Okay, so what we're going to do is instead of doing this method of the for loop, we're going to use what is called apply, the apply method. Okay, and in that apply method, what you can do is kind of an, an anonymous function, which is called in Python is called lambda, and what it's going to do is that for each x, right. And the X is going to be each of the columns of the of the data frame, you know, without considering the index, of course. Uh, we're going to do from the stats library on the SciPy library, we're going to use link regression, okay, which is similar to the LOS of the stats model. And we're going to use as the response, we're going to use the cars seats index, right? Our sales, that's going to be our response. And then the 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 in the, the the independent variable is going to be x. So we have the predictor and the depend the, the independent variable. Then the results they're going to be expanded, and we're going to rename it. So we are going to form a table of these statistics: the slope, the intercept, the r value, right? The r the the, the 
the, 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 R, the R value, the P value and the standard error. We're going to transpose that, you know, that, that uh, data frame so that we have the columns, the predictors in uh, or in the vertical, you know, column. And then in the headings, we're going to have this statistics. Okay, and the statistic that we have really interest is really the p-value, right? We're going to sort it and then we're going to round it to four because if I don't do that, then it's going to give me the scientific uh, notation, all right? So let's run this and this is what we get, okay? So instead of getting all those summaries, now we get a very concise table of each of the parameters that we need from the, you know, from the OLS for the ordinary linear regression. And we get all the, all the predictors, right? You know, from sales. And then we get the p-values and we get it in order. So the question is now, if we have an alpha of 0 0.05, okay? And our, and our null hypothesis is that the coefficient of our independent variable is significant or not. From that table, which are the ones that are statistically significant? In other words, that we have to reject the null hypothesis. So price, advertising, mm -hmm. age, and income. Mm -hmm. Correct, okay. Uh, the sorted values really uh, helps, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. what you have to do is just mentally cross a line where 0 0.05 will be, right? So anything above will be, you know, reject the no hypothesis. In other words, they are statistically significant. And then the rest of them, they're not really statistically significant. So really what, 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 it, what it tells you is that that coefficient, okay, this slope, which is the coefficient of that, you know, of that X, uh, what happens is that if it's not statistically significant, that means that there's a probability, you know, a good probability that that coefficient could be zero, okay? So for example, comprise, education, and population, those are coefficients are not statistically significant because they cross that, you know, zero, a uh, zero line if you, you know, mentally, uh, do a calculation of the confidence of interval between that runs between uh, the values of the values that 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 variable could you know could 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 be okay you know the, remember this is there's a, always a probability that that value could you know could be could be different in the case of price advertising age and income the probability that that value that coefficient is zero is really low and that's what the p value is telling you. You know, some of them are really very low that you just have, you know, four zeros there. Okay. Are we good? Yeah, by the way, yeah. Ricardo, why yeah. do you use the left uh, slash instead of maybe ah, like grabbing yeah. the whole thing in a parenthesis to yeah, avoid that, that, using the slash? Yeah, that, that is a hack, you know, for piping all this, you know, uh, uh, you know, functions, okay? Because for example, this is the main, you know, the main function that I'm that I'm doing, right? Okay, the, the apply, the apply function. But then I'm piping it, you know, the results of that, I'm piping into the re rename, right? So if I don't use the slash, then I'll have to write in one line, I have to write all that. The rename, the index, the slope, the intercept. So that slash then gives me the, you know, the 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 way to then you know se send that pipe to a new line, okay? So it's more legible, okay? But yeah, but th this these are all pipe uh, uh, you know functions, just like in R when you do the the pipe, you know the 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 percent uh, greater than percent the magreter uh, pipe uh, is the same thing. In in, in Python is it's a dot, that that's the pipe. Okay. If yeah, but if, if, to... if I don't use the slash, if I don't do slash, then it will be all in one line. You know, I I I couldn't, you know, kind of, you know, uh, format it in this way, so it's more, it's more legible. 
when I want to pipe in Python, I get lazy and instead of <laughs> typing in the, the left slash. Okay. Like, uh, for example, I would have I would have put a left parenthesis before car six. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's and another then, way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that, that way also I, I have seen it and I have to use it also, okay? But usually I, I use the, the slash mm -hmm. uh, and, and it works it works pretty good. <laughs> okay, you know, different different methods to get to the same, to the same, to the same place. All right, so now that we have those P values, now we're going to do, right? Let me check here. So, okay, so suppose that we control the type one error at level alpha 0 0.05 for the p-values obtaining, you know, exercise A, which no hypothesis do we reject? And we already did that, you know, that exercise, okay? That's uh, exercise B. Now, we're going to do the family-wise error rate, right? Now, suppose we, can, we control the family-wise error rate at level 0 0.05 for the p-values. So, in other words, the the, the the first alpha is going to be 0 0.05. And we have how many here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So, you know, if you go, uh, you know, manually, manually in the bump, bump for running, if we're, if we're doing a bump for running, bump for running uh, correction, we will have a new family, family uh, wise rate of 0 0.05 divided by seven. And that's going to be our new, right? Our new uh, uh, alpha, you know, to, to fail, fail to reject or reject the you no know, hypothesis. So the way that we're going to do it in Python is from the stats model, multi-test uh, library. Uh, there's a multi-test, you, know, uh, you know, main function there. And we're going to call it multi test just to, you know, abbreviate that uh, multiple test. So let's run this, okay. And we're just interested in the p-values here. So because we already have this data frame, right? This LREG, that's what I call on the score DF because it's the data frame. We already have our index, which is the price, you know, the the, the, the columns, the predictor columns and the p-values. So that's all you need. So I'm going to then subset that, right? Uh, data frame with the p-values, we get the, the columns and we get the p-values, all right? But for this function to work, we have to change it to a list. Okay, we have to give it, a, a, you know, the inputs as a list. So instead of only doing the log, log ref underscore df uh, brackets p value, which is the series of that, you know, subset, subset is a series, we're going to convert it into a list. And the multi test, uh, it accepts the list. Uh, you can, uh, I choose your alpha, the alpha, the default is 0 0.05, but I just, you know, put it there for, uh, you know, so you could see it and you can choose the method. And the method will be Bonfer Rani, Bonfer Rani, and we're going to choose just two, you know, two, two of, the, of the columns of that series. The one that says if it is reject, which is a Boolean, and the one that gives us, you know, the, 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 the Bonfer Rani uh, corrections, okay? So if we do this, okay, so we see that in the first list, we see if the, you know, if we're going to reject our hypothesis or not. So if it's true, we reject. If it's false, we do not reject, right? So in the first four, right, the first four, which is price, advertising, age, and income, I says true, right? So that means that when we compare these values, right, to the 0 0.05, that means that, you know, it's going to be less than that, you know, uh, alpha corrected by Bonferroni. And it's going to be less than the threshold. In the other ones, which is false, 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 okay, it gives you the ones, right? Which is, you know, the, 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 the correction that the Bonferroni is doing. The same thing that happened when we did, you know, without the correction, that we reject, uh, uh, we failed to reject on the last three uh, pre-predictors. Okay, any questions there? 
and all clear support. Good. Okay. So now we're going to do the same operation, but now with the homes. Correction. Remember the whole corrections? We use the rank and everything to see if we get something uh, different. So here we use the same, you know, the same syntax for the function. The only thing that instead of the buffer running is going to be home. Okay. So now this is the result. The first four are true. In other words, you have to reject, no hypothesis. And the last three is going to be false. Uh, we failed to reject. Okay, so the Bonferroni and the Holmes correction are in sync in this example. In the fund managers that we discussed before in the book, uh, they were not, you know, you remember they were not in sync, that there was more allowance on the Holmes than on the Bonferroni. Okay, so the last uh, exercise is going to be, suppose that we want to control the false discovery rate the FDR for this query rate at level 0.2 for the p-value, okay, which is the threshold for the for the for the method. So here, what we're going to do is that we're going to calculate those uh, Q values, and we're going to compare them to that threshold, which is going to be 0.2, right? So the, we're going to use the same function, the multi-test, but here instead of the method being Bonferroni or uh, homes, we're going to use the FDR and we're going to use the Benjamin Holzberg uh, method, the one that the book uh, discusses. And you just need one vector, which are, you know, the Q values. Okay. So when we run this, okay, we see that we're going to compare each of those values with 0.2. So this one we reject, this one we reject, this one we reject, this one we reject also which are corresponds to the price advertising, age, and income. And then here, then it uh, uh, surpasses that 0.2, right? That 0.2 uh, threshold, which is 0.28. So we, reject, uh, we fail to reject, we fail to reject, and we fail to reject, okay? And if we want to have a sum of the ones that are within the 0.2 or less, we do this, and therefore, which is corresponds to this for a predictor. Okay, and I guess that's it. <laughs> that's all I have. Any questions, comments? Hey. That this is the last boss meeting. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> okay, as you can see in Python, it's very, uh, you know, uh, apart from this, you know, trip that I had with the linear regression, the rest is pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, you know, thanks to uh, the stats model uh, library. Yeah, I had a question about when you said the sales index. Uh -huh, uh, yeah. Yes. I didn't know, I mean, is it okay to set as index a column that may have uh, duplicate values? Or is it mostly just for the conversion that we needed for this low point of set as columns? Uh, yeah, in, in, in pandas, uh, you can basically use any, any, any column for, for an index. It doesn't have to be unique. Okay. Uh, but the thing is that, uh, uh, you know, usually when you don't, uh, uh, you know, when you, uh, uh, you know, uh, define an index, it, it will give you to you and it's going to start in zero and then it's going to go, you know, uh, you know, uh, number by number, increasing by one, you know all those indices, but they don't have to be. Uh, they don't have to be unique. Okay, that's why we can put you know sales there. So they could be that they, they, they could be some sales that are are the same, but the observations are not going to be the same, of course. Okay. In this case, the set index is to use this this uh, expression. Okay, the line graph. Because the line graph, you know, works with the with the index. <laughs> okay, but good, good, uh, good comment, good comment. Wait, so when you use a line regress, a uh, why couldn't we set instead of Karsich num that index, Karsich num, yes, uh, I know a uh, bracket sales. Do we do that? Or? 
Uh, no, you, you don't need it because the index is sales already. Okay, no, so no, but instead of yeah, uh -huh. instead of making the conversion uh, from sales to index, if we do that to the original data set, let me see. Maybe, maybe it works. I, I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to change also in the left uh, instead of data play to car six now to only to car six. But, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There will be well, yeah, only for columns, the numeric ones, and except for sales. Uh, I think it's too much. I prefer your method now. Yeah, yeah, because it is 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 not like in this one. Let, let me see. Maybe it works. No, so something is a mess. Yeah, it says sales is not defined here. The quotes. Yeah, let me see. Okay, yeah, yeah, could be. Okay, let's Wait, see. Right now we're going to try to do it for categorical sales. Yeah, it, it doesn't like, uh, doesn't like the input. The input's going to be safely coerced. Da, 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 da. Okay. Yeah, let me see if I do this. There's another method here. Sales. And then to, to the left, where we're using data set to which we are applying the apply method. You're using car uh -huh. fix, but we only should not to the left. And I mean, you're, you're putting car seats, dot apply, and then the lambda function. Mm -hmm. But we should only be using the numeric volumes that you found. So something like car seats, brackets, uh, calls. You, you mean uh, here? Yeah. I, I think the problem is because it's trying to do linear regression with the categorical um, and sales. Car seats. Uh, okay, let me let me see this. Um, let's do this. Okay. There you go. Hmm. Yeah. So you don't you don't you don't need the the index. In the in the stack uh, in the post or the stack overflow, you know, they use the index. Yeah, but you don't need it. Good. Yeah, we only get an extra. You only get an extra. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah, maybe that's why uh, they use the index. You know, not not to do the sales. Uh, against sales, you know, mm -hmm. uh, regression. Okay, M maybe that's the that that that's the that's the reason. By the way, do you also use Julia? I see that you have it in your environment. What was that? Uh, in VBS code, it says you have Julia. So, do you also use it? Uh, I've you know I I've played with it. <laughs> Uh yeah, I've I've done a, a couple of things with Julia, uh, but I don't know, I'm I'm still not you know, not a fan. <laughs> no. But it's like uh, I mean, it's such a pretty mix of R and Python. Yeah, yeah. The the the, the thing that I see in Julia is that at least it's uh, compiled. You know, it has a GIT just in time compiler, uh, which you know. Uh, gives you more, uh, you know, be better performance. But right now, you know, with uh, Python using uh, Polars, for example, the, the Polars uh, library, 
uh, you can get really fast without, you know, recurring to another, to another language. And also R is doing, you know, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of development with Arrow too, you know, to speed up, you know, the 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 data frame uh, operation, the player. So and in a way, you know, uh, using I mean, you said uh, about not using another programming language in order to get the speed, but in a way, Polar is doing that right because it's using correct Rust in yep. the background. Yeah, the, definitely Polar's, you know, is 